Good morning. Hi, I'm Thomas, one of the pastors here. Well, that was the right way to start Advent, I think. Thank you so much, uh, Molly, Mary, Will, Holiday. Excellent job. Uh, o come, O come, Emmanuel. We're longing. We're not there yet. We're expecting. And that's what Advent is all about. That's what we're here to celebrate. The already, but not quite yet, of Jesus. Um, Today we're starting also an Advent series, a sermon series, a special series, taking a little bit of a different uh, angle on Advent in the Advent season. Uh, Many of you know our mission at Parkview is to glorify God through the whole church, forming whole disciples of Jesus for the good of all people. And each Sunday we come together both to celebrate the good news of Jesus, uh, but also to equip you to carry that good news to the places you live, learn, work, and play. And that means answering the questions that not only us, but uh, we and people like us, your friends and neighbors might have in the holiday season. And so what we're doing over these next four Sundays and on Christmas is looking at the ways, the specific ways that the good news of Jesus, the gospel, connects to the questions and concerns and problems that everyday people have. And so we're calling this Jesus Delivers. And if you know me, I just can't help but have a little bit of wordplay, a little bit of fun. Uh, Of course, Jesus delivers. Jesus delivers us from Satan's sin and death once and for all. Uh, But he also, in doing so, he delivers us from the domain of darkness into a a new life, a new life that we all know that we need. And so we'll be talking about how Jesus delivers. Jesus delivers meaning that suffering cannot steal. Jesus delivers satisfaction that is not based on our circumstances. Jesus delivers justice that does not create new oppressors. Jesus delivers an identity that doesn't crush you or exclude others. And finally, on Christmas Eve, uh, we will learn that Jesus delivers hope that can face anything. Um, And then we'll be back in the Gospel of Luke, where that'll that'll be a lot of fun too. So I hope you can hear just from that list, this series is going to be helpful for you as we enjoy just different perspectives on the goodness of Christ and what it means, what he's come both to deliver us from, but also to deliver us to but also to help others see why the gospel is truly good news for people like us. Um, and of course, I need to tell you, this, this series is really based off of a book called Making Sense of God by the late pastor, author, Tim Keller. Uh, if you want to hear more, well, copies of this next week out in the lobby. Uh, they didn't get here quite in time. I, th- I blame the Black Friday deliveries and all of that. Um, but we'll have some, some of these next week, so you'll want to check that out. It's a great resource. Um, But uh, having said all this, we're going to start with something light and airy. We're going to start with the meaning of life. I thought we'd start with a nice small question, something nice and bite-sized, you know. How can we find meaning in life? Meaning in life. This is something we all know we need, and we really believe that the Bible and, and Christ through his death and resurrection gives us a unique resource to give meaningful, durable, uh, and in a correct sense, a rational answer to that question. And so we're going to break it down. We're going to ask three questions to, to answer that. We're going to say, why do we need meaning? Then we're going to think about why do we struggle to find meaning? And finally, how does Jesus deliver meaning? I'll say that again. Why do we need? Why do we need it? Why do we struggle to find it? And finally, how does Jesus deliver it? But let me pray for us first. Father in heaven, your word, you say your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We need your light in this Advent season to guide us, to look forward to it, to have you near us, Emmanuel, God with us. I pray that as we open up your word this morning to consider the meaning of life, uh, that by your spirit, uh, you would give us ears that hear your words clearly, give us hearts that are softened to your influence, and hands and feet ready to respond in obedience to you. We pray this in Jesus' name for his glory. Father, amen. Amen. So why do we need meaning? Why do we need meaning? Well, first we have to ask, what does meaning really mean? What do we mean? Uh, Well, there are two senses that uh, both the Bible and sort of modern everyday people use to refer to meaning. The first is a sense of purpose. Purpose. It's, it's, there's some intention beyond our own existence or behind our own existence. Uh, We're not here just to survive. There's, there's some purpose for us here. Second, meaning refers to a sense of significance, uh, that our lives aren't, they're, they're pointing somewhere beyond themselves. We don't just serve ourselves, but we serve something bigger than us. Uh, to put it another way, we need to know that our lives serve some purpose, 
and that that purpose goes beyond ourselves. Okay, I think we can all sort of agree on that. Purpose plus significance, that's how we get our meaning in life. And in a moment, I'm going to show you why I think the Bible shows us that this really is true. And however, at the same time, I want to say, you know, experts in public health and medicine and sociology all across the board are learning more and more what the Bible has been saying for 2,000 years, which is that knowing your meaning in life is not a helpful philosophical question. It's at the heart of what it means to be a human. Uh, <laughs> to show you the significance of this question, why, why we don't just want meaning, we, we wouldn't just like to have meaning as a nice sprinkling on top of a pretty good life, but actually as the essence of life itself, uh, consider this. In, in 2021, Preventative Medicine published an article examining the relationship between physical health and an individual's sense of purpose. Okay? Physical health and their sense of purpose. Here's what they found. People with a high sense of purpose were 24% more likely to be physically active, 33% like, less likely to have problems sleeping, 22% less likely to have an unhealthy BMI. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. Did you really have to say that right after Thanksgiving? Okay, I'm sorry. I have some other ones. Others have observed a relationship between purpose in life and increased impulse control, reduced risk of stroke, reduced risk of developing diabetes, cardiovascular mortality, and in fact, uh, a lower risk of all-cause morality. Mortality. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Okay, if you have a greater sense of purpose in life, you're just less likely to die. Wow, uh, that's astounding. Uh, uh, and it probably goes without saying that having a strong sense of purpose in life is also has a huge impact on your mental health. Uh, simply put, a sense of meaning in life predicts, generally, a longer, happier, less stressful, more meaningful, psychologically fulfilling, however you want to define it, life. Are you surprised by that? No, it's not surprising at all. Um, and we've all felt on the other side of that, the lack of, that lack of purpose and meaning in life just robs us of everything that we need as humans. Um, here's, here's what the Bible said about this 2,400 years ago. Uh, Solomon wrote this, he said in Ecclesiastes 1, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity, it's empty. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. If you've lived any amount of life, you've experienced the reality that we don't just want meaning, we need meaning in life. Uh, you've experienced the, the, the moments that were almost too precious to be shared, moments where your sense of purpose and significance were so perfectly aligned with what your days or weeks or months or moments activities were that you're brought to tears of joy that you're, you have this electric sensation of, this is what I was made for. Aha! This is what I'm here for. This is what I'm made for. This is why I exist. And, and chances are, if you've lived almost any amount of life, you've experienced the opposite end of that. Moments of incredible grief where you feel like you have lost, or maybe indeed you have lost, uh, the meaning of your life. Uh, losing your meaning in life doesn't leave you feeling sort of slightly worse. It's not sort of going from first class to business class in life. Uh, uh, we can't move forward without meaning in life. Our meaning in life is it's deeper than our emotions, our temperament, our personality. It's the north star of our souls. Uh, losing your meaning in life leaves you with a meaningless life. That's, that's the definition of despair, isn't it? And just as an aside, maybe the most disturbing trend that I discovered as I was researching this is that 58% of 18 to 25-year-olds report little or no purpose or meaning in life. 58%. That's from two years ago, by the way. Uh, what, that's especially alarming for us because we're in a city that exists to train and send 18 to 25-year-olds, and apparently three-fifths of them uh, have little or no purpose or meaning in life. Can you see why we feel so compelled to carry forward a vision, to saturate the university network, to send those rising leaders. Um, someone has to intervene. Tomorrow's leaders need meaning and purpose. <laughs> that's vital, but that's an aside. Our bodies need food, water, and shelters to survive, but we're more than bodies. Everyone seems to be, yep, we're, we're more than bodies, and one of the things we need to survive, ironically, is the need to be needed. So having said all this, I just, I have to ask. It only makes sense. What's the meaning of your life? Do you have a sense of purpose? 
Where do you find your significance? Is it clear? What does your life point beyond itself to? The clearer you are about the answer to the question of meaning, the more effective you'll be in fulfilling that meaning, right? Uh, The clearer you are about the answer to the question of meaning, the more fulfilled you will be in doing so. Uh, I'm going to give myself away here. Uh, You know, we're here, so many of us, we're Christians, we believe in the gospel, and you you already have a clear answer. Uh, The Westminster Confession, what does it say? We exist to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Okay. There's a, there's a nice purpose meaning statement, and that's that's true. That's true for all people everywhere. Okay, uh, theologians call this our general calling. General calling, but I want to challenge you, <laughs> if that's you, and you'd say, yeah, I, I have an answer, uh, because the real challenge is not d- just knowing. You know, we can read the Bible and say, okay, I know what God calls every everyone everywhere to do. The challenge is to know with your particular personality and temperament and gifts and limitations that God put in place on purpose, and relationships, and down and down the list. What is your unique calling that God has placed on your life? Uh, What you heard Pastor Mark and I both say uh, in association with our vision is that we will succeed when you find your unique calling in the kingdom of God. Where has he called you to bear your unique influence in this world uh, for the kingdom of God? And, And notice we don't say the unique calling at Parkview, okay? I'm not, uh, this is not a pitch for more Sunday school leaders, although we could use, you know, we can always, you know. But uh, what we want for you is to live a fully integrated Christian life. Uh, To have a sense that you see God's purpose in every aspect of your existence. That you don't, you know, leave your Bible at home and along with it, the part of your life that's most meaningful and then go into work and be a different person. And and not understand how those things are connected. Um, You're not a nurse who happens to be a Christian. Or whatever. You... uh, we want to see that become integrated with your faith and your parenting and your marriage and your job and, and every part of your life. And, and some of you have figured that out, and we want to help you multiply that in others. We want to help, but now I'm on a tangent. We don't just want meaning in life. We don't just crave it. We need it. Uh, we can't live without it. We despair without it. But if we need it so badly, why do we struggle to find it? we need it so badly, why do we struggle to find it? That's the next question. So I hope you've seen we need it. Uh, Why do we struggle to find it? Meaning is hard to pin down. Um, Whether you'd consider yourself here as a secular sort of scientific person, you just see the material world, or a religious person, a Christian believer, many of you are, very few of us could say that we go to bed each night, every night, with a sense that we knew everything we were meant to do that day, and we we were just totally fulfilled in doing it. Um, Martin Heidegger was a German philosopher, not a Christian believer by any means. He said it this way. Humans are distinguished from other living things by their capacity to put, down, put their own existence into question. They're creatures for whom existence as such, not just particular features for, of it, is problematic. What he's saying is that it, it's strange that we find things strange. <laughs> it's strange. No other creature does this. Dogs and bugs and apes don't wonder why they exist. But we do. We think there has to be something bigger. There has to be something more than getting the next meal or getting the next dollar or getting the next relationship, whatever it happens to be. Um, What is it? Now, one of the major causes for this, this struggle, is that we're approaching this question differently, and our culture in general is approaching this question differently than most people throughout history. Uh, Up until maybe 200 years ago, and in many traditional cultures today, the way you found your sense of meaning and purpose in life was by looking outside of yourself. You looked around. You looked to the relationships outside of you. You looked to some higher power. You looked to some other outside authority. And in a sense, meaning was something that someone in charge told you. And you're not free to define your own meaning. Someone gives you your sense of meaning and purpose. They deliver it to you. Your job is to carry it out and fulfill it. And even as I'm saying that, some of you are just cringing a little bit because it feels restrictive. I, I'm not free to define it. Um, it feels, maybe even it feels a little inhumane, or at least maybe a little un-American. It doesn't feel very free to me if someone else gets to define my meaning. But in the absence of meaning that is defined by, uh, or for us by a higher power, by something else, we will inevitably look for meaning in the here and now, 
in this material world, in the natural world, in the things we can see and touch, in the people we can know and talk to and see. Now, first of all, I am not at all saying there's no meaning to be found in this world. There's, there is, uh, as we've defined it, something, uh, a purpose for your life and significance outside of yourself. I think those, are, those things are possible. And on the other hand, I'm certainly not saying that every source of supernatural meaning is good. No way. The Bible does not say that. But it is clear that many of our struggles with meaning come because we approach the question by, of meaning by defining it by ourselves for ourselves. It means that when I ask the question, what is the meaning of your life? What is the sense of purpose and significance that you found? The answer begins and ends within this material world, the things we can touch and see and smell. So you might say, my, my purpose is to be a great healthcare worker. I'm, I'm significant because I, I heal people. You might say, my purpose is to be an artist and to enchant people with, with beautiful stories that help them make sense of life that they resonate with. Uh, I, I'm significant because people are impacted by my work. They're listening, they're buying, they're, uh, they're paying attention. You might say, my purpose is to grow food that feeds the world. Uh, I'm significant because people would starve without me. Look at the difference I'm making. And now before I go any further about the problems with this approach, I, I want you to hear, make sure you don't hear what I'm not saying. <laughs> those, all those things I mentioned, they're, they're legitimate. They're, they're sources of purpose and significance. They work for people. I could give you a long list of Bible verses that affirm the dignity and value of each of those things. But the Bible, <laughs> along with, I'm, I'm pretty sure, your own intuition and a long list of people beyond that will show you that this approach doesn't deliver what our souls deeply need. I have, I think, time to share three reasons why. Uh, first of all, well, I'll name them and then I'll go through them. Uh, created meaning, creating meaning for ourselves, created meaning crushes us. Created meaning is unstable, and finally, suffering steals our created meaning. It's unstable, sorry, it crushes us, it's unstable, and it can steal our meaning. Suffering steals our meaning. Um, if meaning in life is something I manufacture, uh, something I define completely on my own, I start with a blank slate, you know, not with the Bible or my community or something less, well, I have freedom. I have freedom. I have a blank slate. I get to define it for myself. But as we explored, so much of your destiny hangs on having a strong and integrated sense of purpose in life, of meaning in life. Your sense of fulfillment, your mental health, your sense of contentment, even your physical health, it's all hanging on you. Don't get it wrong. Because if you do, you've got, you've got no one to blame but yourself. That's the, the great power of that independence, but also it's an incredible burden. And I think it's a burden no one should have to bear. And I think over time you find I, I can't bear it. To define what meaning looks like, to define something on my own. So created meaning crushes us with its expectation. We're forced to answer a question with unimaginable consequences for our own souls. But created meaning also crushes us because most of the time, a created sense of meaning has to do with our own achievements. It has to do with the things I do, which means if I don't succeed in becoming and doing all the things that I think I'm here for, my life actually loses meaning. I, uh, my purpose is to be a great doctor, a great mother. What, what happens when I don't get into medical school? What, what happens when I slip up and, and, and raise my voice at my kids? When we create our own meaning, our whole sense of purpose and meaning in life, our whole life is constantly in jeopardy. And when we fail our created meaning in life, it can't forgive us. It can only crush us. So meaning, created meaning often fails because it crushes us. But there's more. Created meaning is unstable. Created meanings are unstable. They lack durability. Often they're here only for a season. This is why you felt that season, some of you have, uh, that sending that last kid out of the house and becoming an empty nester, okay, wow, suddenly feels like, less like the entry into a new era of freedom and fun <laughs> and new purpose and much more like a new era of listlessness and relational breakdown. Mm, why does that happen? Because created meetings, are, they're always shifting. They're, they're not constant. It's why retirement is often fraught with loss of purpose. Who am I now? 
Uh, as we age and our bodies start to slow down, it's only natural. Some of the sources of our created meaning, uh, they're just no longer available to us. Uh, now, those first two problems, I hope they convince you, this, the created source of meaning is at least not practical. It's just unsustainable. But there's a bigger problem. If my meaning in life is something in this world, a career, a person, a, a relationship, um, whatever, a cause, then it's not a matter of if I might lose my meaning in life. It's a matter of when. Uh, after all, this world itself will end. Either we will be here for the end of the world, or the world will be here for the end of us. And whichever ending comes first, if our source of meaning in life is in this world only, then our source of meaning will life, in life will end. Uh, and that's the last and most significant problem with creating our own meaning in life. Suffering, in that view, it, it steals our purpose. Death ends our significance. Um, and I, I can't put this better than the people who believe this, so I'll just give a quote here. Thomas Nagel is an American philosopher, not a Christian, and he, he, this is his view. doesn't believe in the supernatural. This is his viewpoint on this problem. He says, and it's just to warn you, this is pretty depressing, so I'm just going to put it out there. Even if you produce a great work of literature which continues to be read thousands of years from now, Eventually, the solar system will cool, or the universe will wind down and collapse, and all trace of your effort will vanish. The problem is that although there are justifications for most things big and small that we do within life, none of these explanations explain the point of your life as a whole. It wouldn't matter if you had never existed. And after you've gone out of existence, it won't matter that you did exist. Yikes. He's not allowed to speak at my funeral. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> If this life is all there is, and there's no God, there's no life, there's no world beyond this, then in the end, it, it doesn't matter. Let's just be honest. Let's think, out the, let's think out the conclusions of that view. My meaning in life is going to be lost. It may be lost in the next 100 years, or if I'm an incredibly spectacular person, it may be gone in 10,000 years. Most of us, maybe somewhere in between. I don't know. But it will be lost. Um, French philosopher Albert Camus likened us to the great Greek character Sisyphus. You remember him? Um, destined to roll the giant boulder of meaning up the hill of life, and yet in the end, it's just going to come back and crush us. Now, some of you are thinking, Pastor, this is awful gloomy. <laughs> Isn't it the holidays? Can't we change the topic? I will. <laughs> but the tension you're feeling, especially if this is the way you view the world, and this is the way many of, many of our friends and neighbors are, if it's not you, uh, this is a tension that you need to feel. You need to sense it. Um, because if, if your view of life leads you to a conclusion that makes you say, would you just stop talking about that? Could you stop thinking out the conclusions of my beliefs? They make me too, too depressed to live. <laughs> then shouldn't you go back and examine those beliefs? Um, here's what I'm saying. If the conclusion is so uncomfortable and so depressing you don't even want to think about it, shouldn't you consider maybe it's just not true? Maybe there's a reason that my soul is rejecting it? Um, if the only way to find meaning in life is to ignore the ending, uh, to not think about your beliefs, then it isn't actually providing one of the most fundamental things that we need, a, a durable sense of meaning. So the reality is that in order to live with creative meaning, you have to end up suppressing your thinking. You have to think, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think out my beliefs. Um, you have to think less, which is uh, ironically, that's what usually Christians are uh, uh, accused of. Being irrational, you have to suppress your beliefs in order to live with purpose, to live with meaning. And so I hope you can see, I hope you have seen why we struggle to find meaning. Uh, because created meanings that we define for ourselves, they crush us, they're unstable because our lives are always changing, and ultimately suffering steals our purpose, and suffering is inevitable, and death finally ends our significance. But it doesn't have to be that way. Meaning is a human need. We don't just crave it, we need it to survive. Uh, and we struggle to find it. You, you need a source of meaning in life that doesn't crush you with its expectations of your achievement and your ability to define it. Uh, you need a source of meaning that doesn't depend on your own achievement. Uh, you need a source of meaning that doesn't require you to suppress your thinking, uh, to suppress carrying out those your vision of, of, of what life is, but actually invites you deeper into further reflection so that suffering actually makes you reflect more deeply on your beliefs. You need a source of meaning that can face suffering 
that suffering can't steal your meaning away, that can face even death itself. And I want to say for that, I don't think there's any other better place to go than to Jesus Christ. And what better time than the Advent season for us to realize what a gift Jesus is. And so let's talk about how does Jesus deliver meaning? We've seen the need uh, for meaning. We've seen why we struggle to find meaning. It's our, our, our source of meaning so often crushes us. Uh, it, it disappoints us. We can't think it through. How does Jesus give us something different? Uh, according to the Bible, meaning in life is not something that can be achieved. It's something that must be received. Meaning in life is not something that can be achieved. It's something that we receive. And this goes away all the way back to the beginning of the Bible itself, the beginning of the world. The Bible tells us that God created a perfect world uh, to spread and share his own love and goodness, uh, and he created humanity in his own image. Where could you go for a greater sense of meaning in life, of significance, of pointing beyond yourself? I exist to represent the one who made all of this. Uh, and, and from the beginning, he said, I myself, I will give you meaning in life. I will be your source of significance. Uh, your meaning in life will come from knowing me, from serving me, from loving me, from obeying me. The creatures could go uh, unmediated directly to their creator, the one who authored their life to receive what their souls truly needed. Now, that's, that's meaning in life that can face anything. But rather than loving and serving God, God's first people, God's first images turned away from him. They decided to, to find meaning in life on their own in their own hands and defied it on their own terms. And as a result, every single one of us is cut off from the ultimate source of meaning and purpose and significance. But even as God left Adam and Eve to their own devices, he saw a future day coming when one of their great, 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 great grandsons uh, would, would come, would be born, uh, but would be born unlike any other man. Uh, in fact, in this man born of a virgin, uh, born without the stain of sin, God was writing himself into the story uh, of history that he had began in the first place. He would turn our tragedies into his triumph. And, and when God looked out and saw that day, he was seeing his own son, Jesus. And, and he saw that if we were going to avoid being crushed by our own self-made meanings, Jesus, his perfect son, would have to be crushed in our place to restore to us our ultimate sense of meaning in life, which can only come from our Creator. And that's what we're celebrating in this Advent season. When God sees us suffering in our sin, God suffering, sees us suffering with meaninglessness, with a lack of purpose, with a lack of sense of direction in life, because we've lost our connection with Him, He sends His Son. <laughs> the pain and power of sin descended on Jesus on the cross. The meaninglessness of death uh, the thing that we all fear the most fell on the person who de deserved it least. The only one who didn't deserve it. Why? Well, the Bible is full of answers to that question. Uh, Hebrews 2 says this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, that is Jesus, likewise partook of the same things that through death, through his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The unending fear of death holds us hostage, holding our sense of purpose and meaning hostage from us. How dare it? That's what God says. How dare you? I'm coming to release these hostages, to release these prisoners who can free us from the unending, impending meaninglessness that death brings and deliver us the freedom from defining meaning on our own. He says, that's actually, it's, it's enslaving. Freedom through Christ is true meaning. It's true purpose. Because unless your meaning in life is achieved for you, you will never stop striving. Uh, you will sense its ebb and flow every day. It will always crush you with its expectations until you see that God, the ultimate meaning of life itself, came into history to be crushed for you. You'll never be able to rest. You'll always sense that you're about to be crushed by a loss of meaning. Uh, you can't entrust your meaning in life to just anyone, but if you turn to Jesus, believe in his sinless life on your behalf and his sacrificial death and submit to him, the meaning of your life is no longer in your hands, and that's good news uh, because it's in the hands of a person who let his hands be nailed on a cross for you. Who else could be more trustworthy to hand your meaning in life to? 
Who else could go further? Who else has gone further? But not only does he deliver us from meaninglessness, he delivers us to a new life charged with meaning, meaning that suffering can never steal. Uh, No longer can suffering steal my meaning away. We get life with God. The lights in the universe come back on and we find a world full of potential, uh, full of sources of meaning that God sends us to uh, because he is meaning himself. We don't have to look there and we can actually face anything. Uh, We get a death-proof, a suffering-proof meaning in life. We get the opportunity to say, I know suffering is coming, I know hard things are coming, but in the end, they can't steal my purpose. They can't steal my meaning because it's already been answered. It's already been given. I didn't achieve it. It's not up to me. And and so 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter can say uh, to people who are in terrible circumstances, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. That's how we all feel, by the way. Suffering comes into our life, and when our source of meaning is in this life only, we're totally vulnerable, and we're surprised. We're surprised. We're shocked. We're suffering. Why would that happen? Why would that happen to me? Uh, God gives us a good answer. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. You may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Suffering. And even death, my own death, who knows? Uh, They can no longer hold me hostage. In fact, consider this. Here's something that no one seems to believe, okay? And no one has the resources to believe except for Christians. Suffering has every possibility of delivering me into a greater sense of purpose, more purpose and meaning. The modern search for meaning gives us no, no capacity to deal with suffering. All it can do is steal my suffering. If my sense of meaning is in this world, suffering and death can only steal my, my meaning. But if meaning in life is to follow Jesus wherever he leads me, and he's proven himself so trustworthy, he can even lead me into death and lead me through the other side, uh, well, I can head toward suffering, the right kind of suffering, knowing, knowing that I won't find less meaning there, I'll actually find more. <laughs> can you believe this? Imagine a, imagine a people who, who believe that. And while Jesus will inevitably rearrange my life, the, the gospel doesn't restrict us like a straitjacket. It gives us freedom to find a new adventure of all of God's purposes for us. Here's what Ephesians 2 says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God received, not achieved, so that no one may boast, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. We're created. Do you hear that? We've received a sense of meaning and purpose in life. In fact, on the one hand, I don't have to search. That's what he's saying. Uh, My sense of purpose and significance in life has been handed to me by a homeless Galilean 2,000 years ago on a cross outside of Jerusalem. Uh, So on the one hand, a, a fruitful, beautiful, difficult, meaningful life uh, it has been prepared beforehand, but not a one-size-fits-all life. You must walk in it. Uh, it's not God controlling every string, controlling me behind the scenes. It's been prepared that I should walk in it, that I should find uh, meaning in him to lay down my life for him and then begin to lift up my eyes as God turns our black and white world into full 4K, 3D color, opens our, our eyes to the needs around us, satisfies us with his goodness, and then begins to point around us to the problems and the people and the circumstances that he has uniquely prepared for us to love and suffer and make a difference in. Submit to Jesus and receive your meaning from him. And rather than becoming less motivated and productive, you'll begin life's great adventure of discovering the good and beautiful things that God has in store for you some of which will hurt, all of which will matter forever, no matter what. Now, in in this season, I hope whether you're here, you're a follower of Jesus or not, I I, want to give you one question to sort of carry with you this week. It's something for you to ponder. Maybe if the opportunity comes up uh, to spark conversations with others, um, consider this. What's, What's giving you purpose in this season of life? What's giving your life purpose in this season. We all need an answer to that question. It's a good one. It may, may, may spark some conversations. What's giving you purpose in the season? And I believe Jesus gives us the most rational, most beautiful, 
and most durable answer of all. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for sending Jesus, your perfect holy son, into our broken world to deliver us. Uh, We thank you for the gift of the gospel and the assurance that it delivers to us. Uh, That the bad things in life will turn out for good, that the good things can never be taken from us, and Lord, the best is yet to come. Help us to enjoy and celebrate this truth during the Advent season and make us agents of hope and meaning as we ponder these things filled by your spirit. Lord, would you open up a door for the good news of Jesus in the places where we live and learn and work and play so we can be and bring the good news of Jesus wherever it is you're sending us. We ask this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand.